Welcome to the final day of ABEC 2014. I'm Bruce Sargent of Farm Boy Productions, and this is your first of two updates from today. This morning, I had the chance to speak with Silvano Ochea. He is a master's student from Texas A&M studying wheat breeding. We talked about his experiences so far at ABEC and his future plans after the conference. I'm here with Silvano. Uh, you were part of the fireside chat with Julie, or was supposed to, um, but had some visa issues, but you're here now, and uh, why don't you give me a bit of a background on um, what you're studying and, and why you're here at ABEC. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my background is in farm breeding. That's my, my training. I study at Texas A&M University in the United States at the moment. I'm pursuing a PhD in farm breeding, and specifically I'm working on um, wheat as part of my project. We are looking uh, into how we can introduce traits from the U.S. wheat into the um, spring wheat adapted to the African countries yeah, as a way to improve yield yeah, of wheat in those countries because it's much more cheaper to introduce traits to those crops rather than importing the wheat itself to other to, to Africa, which is much more expensive uh, because of the markets and uh, oil prices. So uh, that's our focus, and, uh, and the Texas and A&M agency that has been mandated to do research both in the U.S. and assisting the developing countries' students to pursue their research, they have prioritized that, and most of us from Africa, all our projects are geared towards improving uh, yields in, in their crops that are important. So what's, uh, I know you haven't been here for too long this morning, but what has jumped out at you this morning from talks? Yes, it has been exciting uh, presentation that I attended, uh, touching on issues of technology and both regulations and other bottlenecks that farmers face, for, for instance, um, we have technology but we need to think ways of this technology getting to the farmers. At the moment people are talking of uh, in terms of using unmanned aerial vehicles in agricultural production, mm -hmm. um, use of biotechnology. But at the end of the day it has to get to the farmer to have an impact. Mm -hmm. So um, in other words we need to think in better ways how do farmers get this technology given that most the average age of a farmer in most countries is about 50. Mm -hmm. So we need to attract more young people in agriculture so that they can apply these technologies. Mm -hmm. the, the UAV technology I think is really cool, especially in the area that I'm from because it's, uh, it's helping people see fields in ways that they never have before. Exactly, and even collect data, high throughput data, mm -hmm. millions of data points in one second. So mm -hmm. it improves precision of doing agriculture mm -hmm. and making decisions based on data is, is, is part of the critical issues in agricultural production. Mm -hmm. And I think like any technology, uh, the younger that we can get people used to it, the, the better the uptake. Exactly. You know, Taking this to someone who's at the end of their farming career might not be interested, but starting off, very different. Exactly. The, the only way to attract young people into agriculture is kind of make agriculture cool, because mm -hmm. young people are used to doing things on apps and computers. So. If we can make them, we make agriculture attractive, they will definitely come and join. Um, we need to put this information out there so that they can, in their colleges or schools, they get attracted to pursuing agricultural courses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any future plans after this uh, takeaways from ABEC? Yes, um, first of all, my future plan is um, to work in a developing country because that's where I'm relevant. I believe that um, developing countries are way ahead. Um, most of this technology will be most impactful uh, in developing countries because if you look at the yield differences between Canada and, let's say, Kenya, mm -hmm. it's too huge yet. It's Kenya which needs more food, or any other countries in developing country needs more food. So I, I think I would be more relevant to work in a developing country to help um, uh, the lives of farmers there get better. Okay, well, great chatting with you, and thanks for making time for me. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Thanks. I also had the chance to speak with Nina Federoff, the director for the Desert Agriculture Research Initiative from the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. She presented on innovations in arid land production systems.
Nina, you just spoke to the ABIT group about food and civilization, so why don't you give me a little bit of an overview about what you talked about? I addressed the relationship between food and civilizations, both historically and going into the future. So I, all, of, all of human civilization grew and developed because people invented agriculture. They figured out how to make surplus food. And in the last century, all of human civilization was completely transformed to a very modern, technologically sophisticated urban culture because we figured out how to use machines, how to use genetics, and how to use, how to make enough nitrogen fertilizer out of the nitrogen in the air. Those are the three huge innovations that allowed us to go from one billion people to seven billion people. And then my talk was about what do we need to do to actually prepare for having 10 billion people. That's a lot more people. And more importantly, our technological sophistication is bringing more and more countries out of poverty, and as people come out of poverty, they want to add more meat to their diet. And more meat is, requires more grain and more land, but we're out of land. So what do we need to innovate? What in the whole system? Because agriculture is not just about land. It's not just about crop productivity. It's a complicated system of water, energy, nutrients, environment, including land and people. So what are some of those innovations that uh, you included in your presentation today? Well, I think that one of the innovations is how to make grow more crops with less water. Now, part of that is moving high value crops into greenhouses because greenhouses can be 10 times more productive than open fields and use a tenth as much water, okay? But you're never gonna grow your grain in a greenhouse. And today we use a lot of fertilizer and we pollute our waters w with it. So in the area of fertilizer and grain production, we need to get much better at using, at, at delivering and using the fertilizer that, that we um, apply. Uh, we need to get more energy efficient, so right now fertilizer production is very energy intensive. And we can't go back to a world, everybody would love to, to go organic, but organic is an old fashioned and highly polluting form of agriculture. It uses, produces a lot of methane because you need cattle to produce the, to the, to produce the manure that you use as a fertilizer because the primary tenant of, of organic agriculture is a prohibition on the use of synthetic fertilizer. And to go directly to the point, if the whole world went organic today, we could feed maybe half of our population. Because there's that huge uh, production loss with organic, depending on the crop type. Yeah, it's not just a production loss, it's sheer inefficiency. Mm -hmm. And um, so those are just a few of the innovations. We need to figure out a more a less energy in, a, a intensive way of fixing atmospheric nitrogen. Um, we, need, we need a lot of crop innovation through biotechnology. And then we come to people, because people are very much part of this system. And people have, for many complicated reasons, come to be very suspicious of genetically modified organisms. Going into the future, I think that it's pretty essential that we solve the problems of the cost of regulatory processes for GMOs and address the issues of public acceptance. We have not succeeded in, um, in, in communicating to the public what the science has learned, which is that it's not dangerous, it's not, and it's the opposite of what people have come to believe, which is that it's more beneficial the, the crops we have now are better for the environment, better for people, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks for watching this update. Coming next is one more interview from the conference and a look ahead to ABIC 2015 and 2016.